May God's name be hallowed and may our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ increase as we decrease. I'd like to first of all begin by welcoming everyone from their various places, listening and watching from wherever you are around the world. I myself am addressing you from the Middle East in the United Arab Emirates and I pray that the Lord blesses you as you listen in as we take this time to look carefully and examine some of these topics that have been, that have been given to each of us. And I'd like to secondly um, give a great appreciation to a good friend and brother of mine who I love, Gift Maseko, for basically putting together, arranging this magisterial work wherein which all of us may draw close to tending to understand some of the I would say mostly misunderstood, obscured, and burning discussions, not only of this time, but of all time. And I pray that as we all pay together attention and journey together in these discussions through the course of the week, I pray that the Holy Spirit may unveil you know, uh, some of those areas that have been gray shaded, that he may unveil some of those areas in which we may have had long-standing doubts. And um, the assignment that has been given then to me is to speak into the topic denominationalism. And this is how it's going to work. I'm going to basically begin with um, your more simpler questions to your more complex questions. So I'm going to make use of the inquiry-based approach and so we have your, your Eastern Orthodox, we have your Western Orthodox, we have your Protestants, and then we have Roman Catholicism, and then we have Lutherans, we've got, we've got Calvinists, we've got Catholicism, not just Roman Catholicism, because those two are different, there's Catholicism and Roman Catholicism. We've got Pentecost, uh, Pentecostal, We've got Presbyterian, we've got Methodists, and so forth and so forth. And you may have asked yourself the question, but why do we have these divisions? Why is it that we stand so divided? Why are there so many variances within the faith itself? And so the first question then that I'd begin to answer, a fundamental question, the very first question is what denominationalism is. That's the simpler question to answer. And how does it happen would be the second question that stems immediately from that question, what it is. And when we talk about denominationalism, basically the first three terms that I would um, immediately visit are the terms that appear in Scripture that we are all probably acquainted with. And these would be dissensions. Paul speaks of dissensions. And he also makes mention when in different, in different uh, translations, he also mentions um, divisions and then he also mentions factions. So other synonyms that may be used next to that, basically where we see then denominationalism, sectarianism, uh, where we see separation uh, between Christians in the faith. And so how do these happen? Obviously, this would be a next logical question to ask yourself, that how do they happen? And there are really two ways, or there are two categories, from which we can be able to understand the, the place or the origins from which these dissensions would emanate. And the first of the two areas is perspectives-based. Now, with perspectives-based divisions, this is where we understand that there are things like doctrinal, um, doctrinal views that tend to diverge from others. And then secondly, this is where we also do find uh, stuff like traditions. And then the, sec the third thing is where we find preferences. And, and, and with preferences, if I can just, you know, um, partially labor on this part is that preferences could be one of the most one of the most perilous, one of the most insidious and pervasive um, under uh, perspective-based divisions. Why this is, is because if we can refer quickly to, 
you know, the book of Leviticus, if we can just think about that, I'm not going to really open it, but I'm just going to mention it in passing. And if you can remember the um, account of Abihu and Nadab, the two sons of Aaron, to whom the, um, the, the work or the authority as well of um, of priesthood had been uh, uh, devolved to by Aaron, we see that over there what they had done, this is also understood especially, of course, as uh, one of the paroxysms of justice in the Old Testament and throughout the scriptures, of course. We see that over there what the two boys had done is that through what is called experimentalism, so through experimenting, what they had done is to burn a profane fire before the Lord our God. What they had done is to infract the prescriptions and the prescriptive will that God had given in terms of worship, in terms of their duties as priests in the uh, tent of meeting. And what is the whole link between their respective um, uh, outburst of God, the paroxysm of justice, um, and what I'm speaking into in terms of denominationalism. Well, the link is that some of the differences that we have in the faith come from these preferences that people prefer to worship in specific ways. And from that account of Leviticus chapter 10, we see that God had killed people because of that. So, Preferences can be a very dangerous thing. Preferences can be an extremely, an extremely inimical thing before the Lord. And we see today that there are differences in terms of worship. And these two boys had engaged themselves in what is called stylicism as well. So stylicism is basically the concern for styles. And that is one of the things that make um, certain divisions different from one to another because of the fact that they have specific styles that they are most concerned with. Some of the styles that basically go to typify uh, some of the feds, you know, and some of the, um, some of the uh, I would say, uh, trends that we have in the secular world. And it is, as I've mentioned before, a very dangerous thing. And then secondly, the second area, the origins from which we can find the emanation of, um, of divisions is what's called then your conflict-based divisions. This area, obviously, as, as we all understand, is where divisions um, emanate because of the fact that there are conflicts, there is strife, there's pride, gossip and rivalry, all of those kind of things. And those, of course, as we know, have, have, have often caused a tremendous amount of divisions within the faith. And so sometimes we can find that there are areas in which, or times, or, um, or, or places in which we, we may have a mixture of both perspective-based and also your um, conflict-based divisions that become a causality of the divisions or the creation of a specific variant within the Christendom. And then let's move ahead to some biblical and historical references. So we'll begin over here with the book of Revelation, the sixth verse in the second chapter. And we'll remember over here that in this whole account, this is where the, uh, there is a writing by John um, who basically captures the revelation and he is told to write to the various churches by the one who walks amongst the seven lampstands and who holds the seven stars in his hand. And then he says this. So this is in the sixth verse in the second chapter. He says that yet you have this in your favor and to your credit. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, what they are doing as corruptors of the people, which I myself also detest. And then let's link this with Acts chapter 6, verse 5. And I'm going to make sense of all of this in a minute. I know right now it seems as if um, I may be reading a, a, from a scripture that is maybe a bit off topic, but we'll, we'll make sense of all of this to understand exactly where we're coming from and coming to. So Acts, the fifth verse and the sixth chapter, it says, 
Um, now, this is where the seven are chosen. So, it begins with the words, this proposal pleased the whole group. And obviously, if I will begin over there, then many of us would be lost. So, let me just give a context to this passage of Scripture. So, the Hellenist Jews had brought a complaint. They would lodged a complaint against the Hebrew Jews to the apostles. In that, their widows were being overlooked and normally neglected in the ministerial works. So, we're in which, obviously, um, relief would be given to um, the widows. So, they lodged this complaint to the apostles. And the apostles then responded in that, you need to select seven men amongst you, seven men who would be of a tested character, seven men who would be filled with wisdom and the Spirit, seven men who are reputable. And so then this is where verse 5 comes in. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man of a uh, man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, uh, Permanus, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. So let's now begin to formulate an understanding between these two verses. Jesus Christ um, instru instructs John to write to the church at Ephesus that he hates the works of the Nicolaitans, the corruptors of the people. And then now we see that in the book of Acts, as Luke um, transcribes the accounts of what had happened in the early church or the acts of the apostles um, or the acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles, we see at this part that Nicholas comes, his name comes forth. So what's, what's the whole link behind all of this? So the link over here is that Nicholas is basically a, a proselyte. Nicholas is a new convert, all right? So um, the fact that Nicholas was a proselyte tells us that he was not born a Jew but had converted to, uh, from paganism to Judaism. And then we also do see the other thing is that he had experienced a second conversion. Right? So it appears that Nicholas, and the term Nicholas, the name Nicholas actually means conqueror of the people. So we see what is true of Nicholas. What we can then understand of Nicholas is that having converted firstly from paganism to Judaism and from Judaism to Christianity, we see that this was a man who was actually not afraid of taking um, a stand on, con on, on, on contradictory views or uh, controversial views. So that's the first thing that we can understand because the Jews were quite hostile. The Jews were, were really quite harsh towards uh, the Christians. So we understand over there that he was not afraid of, or he was not afraid of taking um, a side of a conflicting view. That's the first thing that we learn. And the second thing that we come to learn is that he actually, he actually was a pagan. He came from a pagan background. And that's the second thing that we understand. And the third thing that we understand is that he was a free thinker. So, given that he was a free thinker, he was not actually afraid of embracing new and liberalist thoughts and ideologies. Why am I mentioning all of this? How does it really gel with all of this? Actually, um, it is understood that Nicholas is the one who began the doctrine of Nicolaitanism. He's the one who the early defector is, another early defector, who broke away from the sacred and fundamental doctrines of the church, the sacred doctrines and the true standing doctrines of the church. And he basically authored the whole Nicolaitan doctrine and began Nicolaitanism. So this is recorded both and agreed by Irenaeus and Clement of Alexandris, and they wrote a tractate they put together a tractate, a classical work called Against Heresies. 
So you can read more about that. So they began, um, this is uh, uh, Nicholas, he began the whole um, sect of Gnosticism in the first term in Christianity. So we can see over there that how, how a frivolous and how a spurious understanding of doctrine can cause a major break away and can cause a contravention from the true doctrines of Christ and create a, div a different division or a sect in Christianity. And just to, to just share with us some of you know, the doctrines that um, Nicholas had taught, he had taught basically what is called uh, syncretism. Now, syncretism is where an individual would have a mixture of, you know, um, a dilution of different practices from different religions. And secondly, he also taught that um, it, it was not necessary for an individual to repent from carnal works or from carnality because of the fact that God was not so concerned with the body of the person or the individual because the body is sinful and fallen. So in that way, he engaged and also taught others to engage in um, ritual sex. And for that reason, he, he basically propagated fornication. And he also taught a hyper-grace inflated doctrine. That's another thing that he had taught. And these were huge repudiations. And that is why Christ mentions that he hates the works of the Nicolaitans, the corrupt of the people. So he basically subverted people and he caused for the people to have a very sick faith and a focus on a very inimical doctrine. And so we may then continue from there looking at other areas. And also within scripture, we also do see from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12. And let's go through this one very quickly. So it says over here, But I say this, there is one of you who says, I am of Paulus, and one who says, I am of Apollo, and one who says, I am of Kepha, or Kephas, and one who says, I am of the Messiah. So, we see over here, this one is really quite blatant. This one is, is very blatant. In this specific passage of scripture, we, we learn over here that Paul the Apostle is confront, uh, confronting and addressing the divisions. That some are saying that I am of Pauline, all right? They're from uh, the, the sect of Paul, or they're from the camp of Paul. And the others are saying that I am from the camp of uh, Cephas or Kepha. And others are saying that they are from the camp of Apollo and so forth. And others are saying that of the Messiah. And we understand that this really fits so much on what's happening in these contemporary times in today's world where others are saying that I'm a Presbyterian, I'm a, a Pentecostal, and I'm a Lutheran, I'm a Calvinist and so forth. That We see that they call themselves after people's names or after the um, authors of specific doctrines. And we see that this has been happening from the very point of inception where Christianity, the first church, had first been incorporated. So we see, we see that um, these divisions or dissensions come as early as the book itself. So, um, we, we, there are many other things that we can basically learn about um, Apollo. You know, we, we understand that, again, of preferences, people, uh, people in that time in the early church, they, they really, um, I would say some of them, um, they really, I would say, um, appealed mostly or they, they felt that they had a greater, a greater understanding or preference to um, Apollo because of the fact that Apollo had a, a Greek education. So with the Greek people, we do understand that these people are people that um, really liked mental elaborance. Um, they really liked intellectual gymnastics. Um, these are people you'd see where Paul especially preaches at the Areopagus. So these are people who were really rational people. They 
they really liked big ideas you know they really liked big thinking and all of those kind of things things that were really intellectually challenging and so apollo um is someone who had a greek education or greek background and so he was one of those who could appeal or who could use very well um the rhetorics so he was he was a good rhetorician and that is why um he was more appealing to some of the greeks as they said that they would um they would prefer mostly apollos and that is why you see that at later passages or later parts of scripture you see that paul says that i paul um planted and apollos watered so you see that apollos is someone who came second to paul in terms of providing other doctrine in terms of edifying the souls of the christians and empowering them and so forth and so let's look at, at then a few other historical divisions where other uh, divisions came through in the history of things and so another one of the early defectors now that we've looked at you know the uh, references in scripture now looking at the historical account um one of the other early defectors was what's known as the marcionites so marcionism is basically a division that was begun by um the bishop of sinope in the year 144 so this was another heretic so this was a strong a strong heretic um marcionism ran for about 300 years in the west and continued for more centuries in the east what did they believe in so marcio of sinope strongly rejected the old testament he did not believe in the old testament god and then second to that marcio um indoctrinated the idea that the old testament god which is the god of the jews the old covenant god is not the same god who is father to jesus christ he maintained that jesus christ had a different father and this god was the good god as he termed him and so this was an extremely a terribly inimical uh, group of um, christians as they call themselves which are definitely not christians but this was a very very inimical group of christians or a sect and it actually is said that they had a very strong um uh, ecclesiastical organization that rivaled or paralleled that of the catholic church so they were quite they were quite strong in their their organization they were quite strong in their organization and it also is said that this has been by far the most um dangerous foe in christianity we could even say that these people were the nemesis of christianity and then moving right along we we also do learn that there's also uh, surprising and interesting things that happened at the council of nicaea in the year 325 now when you look into the council of nicaea that was um created by uh constantine the great um what he did is that he he brought together you know the bishops and he brought together seeing that it was really important in society um to have both politics and religion stand together he saw rather the importance if i can put it in this way that he saw the importance of politics and religion and so he created this um council of nicaea and over there we see the surprising origins of the trinitarian doctrine um you can read more about this um there's an article called um as of as of mentioned it the surprising origins of the trinitarian doctrine that was put forward by a site called beyond today um the united church of god and what we see over there is that there was a man called um arius so arius uh, basically indoctrinated he propagated that jesus christ was less a god because of the fact that he was the son and god the father is older and so jesus christ was actually god's special creation and he was less of god and then against him was um uh, saint athanasius and some of you may have heard of the uh, epitaph 
um, that that's basically quite uh, popular. And this epitaph goes Saint Athanasius contra Mundum, which really means that Saint Athanasius against the world. Now, um, Athanasius was a doctor of the church. Athanasius was a, a defender of the faith, and he was the one who basically spoke about or spoke into and propagated the doctrine of uh, the Trinity. So um, this is this is where we then understand the whole link to this. This is where we understand that uh, several divisions and dissensions had come from differing views once more. So Unitarianism, which also sticks closely to monotheism, um, that there is no other God, it's only God, and there is no uh, Trinity. So, which of course um, is true, but it is a partial truth. There is only one God, but in this one Godhead, there is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But other sects, of course, do not believe in this. They believe that there is only one God, and God the Holy Spirit and God the Son are not at all gods. And, and and so forth. And we understand then from there that this begins, of course, a division that is based on uh, perspectives. And then further to that, we see that there's uh, your Protestant Reformation. Uh, Protestant uh, Reformation began around, uh, of course, as most of us know, around the year 1517. So we've moved from the year uh, 144 to the year 325. And now to the uh, later centuries in the year 1517 uh, along the timeline. So um, the Great Reformation by uh, Martin Luther. Um, where he nailed his 95 theses on the doors of the church and all of that created a great eruption of Protestantism. So that began from those times, 1517, around the 1600s. And further to that, then, we see uh, other divisions. Now, these are different divisions. Um, these are divisions that were caused by uh, sociological um, changes or sociological structural changes in society. So that's where we see the age of reason. That's around the uh, year 1685 and it ran for about 130 years. So the age of reason has also been quite a huge contributor um, to how people view things and has also birthed a lot of liberalism. And then we also do see uh, postmodernism. So postmodernism, it's unknown when exactly postmodernism had began, but we see that postmodernism had amounted to its great height around um, 1960s, um, around those times. And then let's look into the more, uh, I would say, the more complex question to ask. And the more complex question now is that should divisions be dissolved for unity in the faith? And I, I really do appreciate this question that do we think that these need to be dissolved? And I'll refer us, I'll, I'll point us to a part of scripture in the first, uh, the book or first uh, letter um, of Paul to the Corinthians in the 11th chapter and the 19th verse. Uh, over here we see that it reads in this way that Paul says that for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. So what we can really put forward in this, in this specific um, case is that conflict-based divisions um, are to some extent a necessity. Um, these are necessary for continually exposing those who are of spurious and questionable and unrepentant character. So it's, it's, it's necessary that we have these dissensions, as Paul says, that there must be factions amongst you so that these people may be seen who truly stands in the faith and who truly stands in the correct doctrines of the faith and who is strange, who is foreign within these um, uh, parts of the faith. And then we also do see in the book of, I'll read also the book of First Corinthians um, chapter 1, verse 10. We see something surprising happening over there. This is what Paul the Apostle says, again to the Corinthians, he says, But I urge you, believers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
that all of you be in full agreement in what you say. So we, we see now something that is sort of like a contravention. It's contradictory to what he was saying in the first part uh, to the Corinthians in chapter 11, verse 19, where he says that it's necessary that they be there. But in chapter 1, uh, verse 10, we see now that he's, he's imploring, he's urging uh, the believers in Corinth that all of them be in full agreement. Let's continue. He says that, yes, of course, um, that you be in agreement in all that you say and that there be no divisions or factions amongst you, but that you be perfectly united in your way of thinking and in your judgment about matters of the faith. Very interesting. So how do we, how do we find resolve and how do we reconcile these two views that somewhat appear to be opposing to each other? So what's the middle ground? How do we marry these two? And this is, this is, this is how we basically could marry these two. In that the desire to dissolve and reconcile denominations resulting from perspective-based divisions is to unobtrusively imply ecumenism. So this means that an ecumenical convergence has to be genuine and it has to be authentic corresponding views have to be truly genuine and these views have to submit to um, they have to submit to the auspice of holy spirit in other words it means that they must yield to the guidance they must yield to the protection they must yield to the support of holy spirit otherwise if there if there could be any kind of ecumenical um, attempt and it's not done under the auspice of holy spirit then really what we are doing over there is to to just set ourselves up for something that is going to blow up in our faces something that would not be genuine something that would be some uh, fundamentally subtle hypocrisy. That's really what it's going to be. So we will have consistently clashing views. So if we are to dissolve all of the existing, the existing denominations and bring them all to convergence, it means that truly we must hold the same view. That's what Paul the Apostle is saying over here as his words maintain over there, that, that you be perfectly united in your way of thinking. So there would not be any diverging ideologies. There would not be diverging views and outlooks on what doctrine, um, on what doctrine should be taught. So the conclusion basically is over here in where Paul the Apostle writes to Timothy in his second epistle. This is the panacea to all of the, the divisions that stand um, today in the Christendom. And this is in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2 from verse 15 to, uh, to verse 19. From chapter 2 verse 15 to 19 reads this way, that study and be eager and do your utmost to present yourself to, the, to God approved, tested by trial, a workman who has no cause to be ashamed, correctly analyzing and accurately dividing rightly handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. So, and then again in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, this is what it says, that and we are setting these truths forth in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Holy Spirit combining and interpreting spiritual truths with spiritual language to those who possess the Holy Spirit. So, this goes to say that the reason why there are delusions, the reason why there are factions, the reason why there are divergences in understanding, you know, the scriptures, our views, our perspectives towards biblical doctrine, is because there are those who indeed have not undertaken to read or approach the scriptures and teach them through the help of or the auspice of Holy Spirit. So what we then learn over here, finally, is that all church activity, all liturgy, all scriptural reading, 
should be ever the more strictly and rigorously done under the auspice of Holy Spirit. And unless that is done, we will continue to have even the more divisions and denominations in the faith. And may the name of the Lord be praised.